Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing marvellously well. I'm sitting here with my friend, Mr. Adam Steele, who has a channel called Hop Pole Studios. I was drawn to Adam because primarily I loved his videos and also I could see that he was multi-talented. One of the things that's really important to me as a guy that plays guitar, bass, drums, keys really badly, drums quite badly as well, is I feel like this is the new normal for us is... The ability to be, you know, a producer, an engineer, a mixer, a multi-instrumentalist, you know, it, and, and like Adam, an educator. So, Adam, it's great to have you here. Thank you very much. It's a, an absolute pleasure, as, as always. This is your home environment here, then? Yeah, this, this is what I call Studio B. This is actually my kind of office. Uh, this is where I usually just sit and do my video editing for the YouTube channel. And I've got a few guitars behind me. Uh, so I'll do a bit of tracking at home. Uh, I've got my lights set up. We do a weekly podcast, which I do from here. Uh, but everything else I do from the studio, which is a 45 minute drive from my house. I don't know why I'm pointing. It's not as if you can see the direction. <laughs> but yeah, um, usually that's where the bulk of my work gets gets done. And then I'll do all the tracking there, check mixes on monitors. And then I'll come home and quite often at the end of the day, uh, when the baby's in bed, I'll do all my mix prep at home you know, edits, clean everything up, make sure it's ready for when I've got a clear head to do a proper mix, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I've converted this into a little kind of tracking station. Under my desk, I've got a JCM 800 and a 5150 uh, with a, a load box, one of the two notes captors and a cab M. Yes, I mean, you can't go wrong with those. Uh, but it, yeah, it, it, it's an absolute mess under my desk because I've just chucked everything in uh, to, to record with because I literally can't leave the house. But it means I'm getting some amazing tones. <laughs> So, doing okay. You are pretty darn au fait with uh, Reaper, to say the least. You you know it inside out. And I've got to say... So I'm told. I, 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 <laughs> I know this is how I found you. I had watched some of your videos, and then I asked Glenn, who's a mutual friend of ours, who he would recommend. And he goes, oh, there's yes. this guy, Adam Steele. And I was like, oh, I don't know Adam Steele. And then he sent me the link. I was like, oh, but I know this channel. I hadn't put two and two together. That's fantastic. It's it's funny how the whole Reaper thing came about. I've been using Reaper for about 10 years now, It's it, it turns out. And it's just one of those things. I've been doing audio production for 15 years or more. And I'd been using Cubase and Pro Tools and uh, a friend of mine recommended Reaper 3 at the time, and it did all the stuff that I wanted. This is way back 2010, I think. And it, di it didn't have all these issues that Cubase had at the time. Uh, it wasn't limited, like, again, like, I couldn't afford a Pro Tools HD system at the time, but Pro Tools LE was limited to something like 32 tracks or something like that, which sounds like loads. But when that includes all your aux tracks, all your instrument tracks, so on, so on, so on, that runs out really fast. And so I got hold of, of Reaper and I think I've recorded my first album with it the, the week after I'd first got hold of it. And we produced an entire album for a band in about six days. And I was just blown away with it. So from there, I just started digging and digging and digging and digging. And it can do all these incredible things. And as it's gone on, it's got more and more and more features. And so I think as time's gone on, I've picked up every feature because they were new. Uh, so to me, it was just a little thing extra, little thing extra. And so it's, it's built up. And it's one of those things where I went back to Cubase a while back because someone recommended it. And it wasn't bad. Uh, but it didn't do the things that Reaper did, you know, and all that kind of stuff where I, I, a few clients bring in Pro Tools sessions, especially when I do a lot of work in film and TV and video, which is the other side of what I, I do. And it feels really clunky in comparison and everything takes forever to load and oh, okay. And it's just one of those things where um, I just happen to use Reaper and I've been telling clients in the studio about it. And then when I started up the YouTube channel, I assumed more people used it than, than actually kind of do, especially at the top level. Certainly didn't consider myself at the time to be a, a top level user. But, it, but as I got more enthusiastic about making more videos for the channel, because I had this studio and I may as well, you know, that's how the channel started. Uh, 
I made this throwaway video one night. It was kind of a, a webcam capture in my then bedroom, which was, here's how you do the basic stuff in Reaper. And didn't really think too much of it because I was doing these properly produced videos every week. And this was just kind of a filler. And it got loads of views and then loads more and loads more and loads more. And at, at last count, I think it's had a quarter of a million views. And I was like, what is this? So, so then I went, right, okay, let's go back. Let's, let's start again. And so I did the basics, which most people who've seen me on YouTube have seen the newer Reaper 101 basics video where we did it properly in the studio. And that's now, I think that's just cleared 300,000 views at last count, which is for me ridiculous. What I've noticed about Reaper users is they are the most passionate DAW users. So no matter what the you know the actual percentage of reaper users is is they're all incredibly vocal yeah. as a a hardened reaper user like yourself can you can you give me some some feedback on what makes it unique for you what works in your workflow so the reason that i think reaper is so incredibly intuitive is because it's so open it works the way you want it to work if you've got a way in your head that you think it should work, it doesn't take too long to get there. I used to use Reaper completely differently to the way that I use it now, and it works both ways. I used to use it where I'd record stuff onto tracks, and then I would send all the audio out to uh, sends to, 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 to groups, which is the way you would usually think to do it, right? Is you would have all your drums go to a drum group and that kind of thing. And that was actually taking a long time and causing me issues later down the line in terms of stems and that kind of stuff. And then I found folders. <laughs> and folders, like say if I have all the drums, I make another track and I grab all my drums and just budge them up. In fact, I'll show you that. Because um, that's something that's, that's absolutely incredible and takes two seconds. So all these drums, if I just move them... They are just tracks and they'll come out the master. If I select all of those drums and just move them up, you'll see a little blue line appear under the drums where it says drum group, because that's what I've named it, and let go. And those, all the sound now comes out of that drum group. And I've not had to do any routing or anything complicated. And the benefit there is I can do things like I can tuck them away. I can minimize them and then bring them back up again, which I can do exactly the same in the mix view. So if I've got, say, 12 or even 20 or even 30 drum channels, if I'm doing some crazy prog rock thing, uh, if I'm then trying to find where the guitars are and they're a mile down the, the mixing desk, that's going to take me forever to, to flick between. If I can just hide them in their folder, then I can keep doing that and hide the, all the different groups, like hide this trumpet group, solo group, and suddenly I can see my entire mix in about nine channels there. And if I need to dive in to change anything, I can just press that folder button and just pop that back open. And that's good for clarity of mind. And for me, clarity of mind is what makes for a quick production because I need the, the workstation to get out of my way so that I can spend more brain time on the mix and not fighting the software. So this is a, a band that I recorded years ago called Sandboy. Uh, the band aren't together anymore, but I'm still friends with most of the members. Uh, but this was a track that I really quite enjoyed uh, called Call Me Up. And I'm not going to play the entire thing, but I'll just play a couple of little bits. That's actually something that I've always uh, liked about Reaper, just as a quick point number one, is that this project is from 2013. I'm just going to bring up... Yeah, so recorded February 2013. It's from a much older version of Reaper and it just opens no issues at all. Uh, every other DAW that I've ever used, you try opening something that's uh, that's seven or eight years old in a, a new version and watch it panic. <laughs> and another thing before I even hit play is at the top right corner here is a little button for monitor effects. So uh, I'm using headphones because I'm stuck at home in my home studio and I've got Sonarworks running. And Sonarworks is correcting my headphones, which is brilliant. You can use that in any DAW, but because it's in a monitor effect up there, it's not on the master out, which means that when I'm done, when I've mixed, if I hit render, that doesn't get applied 
to the song. I mean, you're supposed to bypass it if you're using it. But how many times do we all forget? So, I mean, I used to do stuff like that all the time. I used to have like a corrective EQ on the master so that I could hear it clearly when my room wasn't treated very well. And the number of times you forget to turn it off, render that and send it to a client and they go, what the heck is this? It sounds awful. And you go, uh, oops. So it's one of those things that saves me tons of time and it's always there because it's separate from the project. That is smart. I've never heard of that. Yeah. It's one of those little things. It's separate from the project. So any project I open up, it all goes through Sonarworks, uh, which is the same in my studio with a corrective setup on the Adam A7s that I'm using. Uh, so that's very, very useful. I mean, it's all mixed internally at what's called 64-bit floating point, which I think is the same as every modern DAW. So the quality is absolutely on par with anything. Here's something that I found really cool. Uh, so this is, let's say this is the vocal, and that's vocal one. You can see the, the wave form here, and you can see how loud it is, but you can't see anything else. I mean, yes, it's blue. But if I go to view peaks display settings, I can change this from peaks to spectral peaks. And if I just let this build for a second, this is going to do something that I've never seen in any other DAW. And I tend to have this enabled by default. Uh, the reason it's not on on this project is um, when I actually recorded this project, that wasn't a feature in Reaper. It's, it's been added. And what's happening here is it's building up all these things and you can see little colors like the uh, yellow here means that that particular piece is really mid heavy. Uh, the red is, is lows. Uh, some vocals, especially where you look at, yeah, I can see little blue bits here and the blue bits, what they're telling me, there we go, is that's where sibilance is. So I can see different frequencies. I can actually see what the singer's going to say and what they're going to sing before I even hit play. So if I see a bit that's really strongly a sibilant, I can get rid of them very, very, very quickly and just jump between them. I can see when a kick drum is on a channel or like the, the bass, if I just zoom in on the bass, that's all a bright shade of purple and blue because that's all the low frequency information. That saves me tons of time when I'm editing. That's a, a very funky little feature. If I hit play on that bass, I've got this nice thumpy bass that you should be able to hear. And then if I open the effects window, uh, I've got all my uh, effects in a nice list here. So I've got Amplitude by everybody's favorite, favorite IK multimedia. Uh, going through Wall of Sound and Mr. Slate's wonderful virtual mix rack. But at the, if I hit Mixer at the bottom, that starts out like this, this bottom row here where we can see all the faders and the pans. But if I just drag that, make that a little bigger, suddenly that pops and becomes like Pro Tools' uh, edit view, uh, mix view, where you can see all your plugins and all your inserts, all your sends. And I make that bigger and bigger and bigger and I can have more and more and more plugins. So there is no limit to the number of plugins you can have on one particular track. If you're being a mentalist like sometimes I I like to have a little bit of compression a little bit of EQ a little bit of this a little bit of that uh, you can have an endless list of plugins on a track and that's not a problem even before I hit play the other thing is there's no such thing in Reaper as different kinds of tracks this is probably the biggest thing that sold it for me is there's no aux tracks there's no buses no groups no instrument tracks none of that stuff they're all just tracks, which is completely freeing. It'll take a second for you to go, wait, what, what do you mean they're just tracks? What that means is like, say the, uh, the drums, which were recorded with, with a MIDI drum kit at the time, uh, they were actually played in, but they were played on one of those Roland E kits. Uh, the MIDI was recorded in and there's the MIDI and it's not a MIDI track or an instrument track. It's just, we chose the input to be MIDI. And I can actually record audio onto that same track if I so desire, and that'll just work. It might sound mental, but it's the kind of thing where um, I can have, like, at the end of my project, I've got a group of effects where I've got uh, plate, reverbs, delays, all that kind of stuff. The, the kind of stuff you'd usually use on a mix, you know. Uh, but I've not had to make auxes or do any awful routing. I literally just made new tracks put the plugins on there for the reverb and that kind of thing where I've got uh, lustrous plates from Liquid Sonics 
And then I just sent from a send from on from one of the tracks some sound to the plate reverb. Done. It works much like an analog desk would, if you think about it that way, where if you've got a big, you know, 90-something channel analog desk, you might have reverbs that come back on channel 80-something, I don't know. So you just send to that channel. And that just works. And nice and easy is what it's all about. Um, it's it's rapid production. Another thing that's dead simple, but why haven't the other uh, guys thought of it, is if I've got one project that I'm working on, and let's say I've got a different track and I want to just flick back quickly, I can go to File and New Project Tab, and at the top I've got Project Tabs like Chrome Tabs. So I can open a completely different... Like, this is a mix of... Uh, Chelsea by Dragged Under that I did last week that's only using Reaper's stock plugins, which I, I did for, for fun. But yes, provable. You don't need third-party plugins. Uh, they are quite capable. I do use a lot of third-party plugins, but as a point, I made this. But I could play a bit of this. So place, so Click on the other tab at the top, hit play. And as long as I've got the CPU available to me to run more than one project, then I can click uh, between them and I can copy and paste tracks from one project to another. So if I've got, oh, I liked that bass tone on this on this song, I can have both projects open and just go copy paste <laughs> and go. And that saved me so much time. Or little things like if I go to the render window, uh, if I've got an engineer that says, yeah, that, that song was great. I need the stems. With a lot of DAW, someone says stems and you, your heart stops and you go, dun, 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 that's going to take me days. With Reaper, I bring up the render window and go source stems and I literally just control and click or on Mac option and click the tracks that I want. And then at the end, I make sure my time selection is right and I can name them up here with these wild cards. So it names them automatically for me and I hit go and there they are. They're done. So hold on, hold on. That's great, but what do you mean? It, it names them automatically? It, it knows what they are? How do you mean? Right. So that's a big thing, yeah. So where it says wild cards, let's say, um, let's say this song's called Dave, just to be silly. Uh, but if I call this Dave and then dollar sign track number and then dollar sign track, uh, then what's going to happen is it gives you a little preview where it says 24 files here because I've selected 24 tracks. If I click that, that gives me what they're all going to be called. And they're all going to be called like Dave, 17 vocals, one, 21 harmonica. I can add whatever I want to that file name. I could then add more onto the end of that, call that, you know, mix one or whatever it is. And they're all automatically done. The file names match up to exactly what That's I wanted them to fantastic be. fantastic when you're sending tracks to people to mix. Because oh, uh, tell me about it. Yeah, it saved me days. Yeah, that's that's a really good function. Uh, we have to do that when uh, when we're uploading stuff to our academy for people to mix. We we want to go in there and rename yeah. everything because we don't want it to be confusing when they're downloading multi tracks. And it's like I've got forty seven tracks called guitar. Which one's the right one? Right. Oh, so you have to. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. smart. Yeah, I like that. Saved me days, and the, the, um, even things like um. Um, you see behind it on the timeline, there's a big grey bar. That's a region. So if I've got, say, more than one song in a project, I can add multiple regions. And then when I'm exporting, I can say, instead of exporting the stems, export me those regions. And I can name them. So I could call them the names of the different songs. And then I can tell it to render or bounce all of them for me. And I go off, I make a coffee, I come back, they're all done which especially if you're working on a big project and I've used this on like film ADR and TV production where you might have loads of little things like a stinger for this, a clip for this, but you need it all to be in one project. Otherwise you're going to go dizzy because it's a big thing. But then I work on it all. I export them all, send them all to the client and the client says, that's great. But this 190 things that you've sent me, I need them to be a little quieter and I need an EQ tweak. And you go, oh, well, that's my day gone. Not with regions. I literally then go in, change my EQ, turn the volume down, maybe put version two at the end of the file name, export all the regions, click. Okay, there you go. Five minutes later, send them. <laughs> that's amazing. It's, it saved me 
days and days because I don't just use this as a music producer. I use this for film sound. I use it for ADR. I use it for all sorts of stuff that can be quite basic, but it's time consuming. Yeah, organization is huge. And you're talking about film and TV. I've done a lot of stuff for film and TV as well. And I have learned when I'm talking to video guys that you have to make it absolutely... Mm. What I do, for instance, is when I bounce something for film and TV, I'll do, you know, a instrumental mix, a one with the vocals, one with backgrounds, but no lead vocal. You know, all the things you would normally do. But I'll do it in 48K, yeah. 44.1, 88.1, 96, stereo interleave, split mono, and I'll give them everything because I've made that mistake where I've sent them something and I become the full guy. I'm the one that the reason why the project didn't get finished. And when you're doing audio for film and TV, make sure you covered all your bases. You give them everything really well labeled because you do not want to be the guy that's the problem. Because if they get behind in the edit... Suddenly it's like, well, you know, we had to wait for the right audio to be sent. So organization and making sure that they get everything they need and more is the best way to protect your career as an audio guy in film and TV. <laughs> so that's marvelous. Absolutely. It's all about saving time compared to some of the, the big boys like, you know, Pro Tools and that kind of thing where they are, you know, industry standard and they're great. I'm not going to say they're not. But the, one of the reasons that I used Reaper to begin with is that all these little features and functions were saving me hours and the hours turned into days and the days turned into God knows how much, especially because when I started using it, yes, I was running a tiny little indie studio, but more than anything, I was the post-production and video editor for a small indie media company. And being a, a trained sound guy, I didn't want that to take all my time when I really needed to work on the, the, the video side of things. I should have been able to do the things that, you know, I do for a living, which is the audio. I should have been able to do that as go, 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 done, next. And things like Pro Tools were holding me back in that regard. And it's like, well, it shouldn't be this way. So this is version six of Reaper. This came out very recently. And this is the default version six theme. Everything's in different places to where it was in version five. Uh, if I go to options, themes, I can go to default version five and I can change the entire view. That's how version five looked. Uh, so if you preferred where everything was then, it's not changed the way that it works in the background. All the functionality of version six is there, but it looks like how you remember it. You can download custom uh, skins where you can make it look like something out of Star Trek. You can make it genuinely someone's made the L cars next generation theme. Um, it, you can make it look like Pro Tools if you so desire. Uh, there are things like um, you can add little icons at the end of each track. So like the bass, I could add a little bass icon like Logic does that really kind of spell out what, what every track is. I personally think that's a waste of screen space, but for other people, that might be something that makes them feel more at home, you know. Um, there's all sorts of stuff you can do. I'll put it back to the default. There's a thing called Actions, and Actions is incredible. So the Action List... This massive long list is everything that Reaper can do. And it's like 20, 30,000 things that it can do. And you can assign any of them to a keyboard shortcut. So if it's something you use a lot, then you can put things that, in, that you might have used in other DAWs and really uh, speed up. One thing that I keep meaning to do, this is a new laptop for me, so I've not customized this at all yet. This is completely stock. So what I'm going to do now is actually customize right before your very eyes, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, usually, if I right click on transport, there's a thing I use a lot, which is uh, remove contents of selection, moving later items. And that's in video land, that's what they call a ripple edit that will say there's like 10 seconds of silence in between two things. And I just want to get rid of that and move everything afterwards. So it just stunk as if that 10 seconds was never there. Uh, that's something that I do a lot in film work where there's just a gap and we don't need that gap. Uh, but right now I'm having to right click on a menu and find that in a, a deep, dark menu. So uh, in actions, there's a filter. If I start typing in, remove selection. Where is it? Uh, it should be here. 
There it is. So remove contents and time selection, moving later items. I can add a shortcut and I usually have it on Alt and Z, which if I remember rightly was the Cubase shortcut for the same thing. And just hit OK. Uh, something else is mapped there, which I never use. So I'll just override that. And that's it. Now, anything else, if I just select it and hit Alt Z, bang, gone. That saves me days. <laughs> so my question is, is are there people that have created templates already that mirror other DAWs? Uh, yes, there's loads of that. There's a massive community. Uh, there's a, a package manager for it as well, which has been created, which you can install, which is very lightweight. I don't think I actually have it installed because like I said, this is a brand new install, but there's a package manager. And so any themes, any updates, any customizations, you just look through the list for it you double click and it downloads it, installs it, does all that for you. And so that then becomes an option. If it's one of the, the customization themes or anything, they, they're in those lists. There's a massive forum for Reaper as well, where everybody who's a massive tinkerer, like we were talking about before with uh, there being a really kind of, not to use the wrong word, but an avid community, <laughs> uh, where um, they, um, they're all absolutely passionate about what they do. And so there's a massive resource of people willing to help you out if you've got a specific request or you can't find a certain thing. It probably already exists and someone's done it and can point you to it because that's what the community's like. By the way, what uh, what interface do you use? At the studio, I use an RME Hammerfall, one of the their radar interfaces, and then I just plug a load of preamp banks in. Uh, I've got the Audion ASP800s and I've started Excellent. using an... Uh, what's it? Uh, I, Arturia have the Audio Fuse 8 Pre. I'm using that right now and it's incredible. Uh, so that's usually my uh, main kind of preamp bank for, for non, non vintage stuff because I've got those uh, vintage BBC preamps, but they have to go into something. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm using this Arturia Audio Fuse and it's been really, really helpful, especially at home when I'm trying to do all this amp recording. And when I'm not using that, I've got an audience sono, which is right next to me. I uh, absolutely love the audience, guys. But that, me that only has two inputs. And for what I was doing, I needed more than two. So um, I didn't have an ID44 to hand. So the Archoria got broken out and uh, came out of the rack in the studio and came home with me uh, for the time being. And that's going to go back in the studio, pride of place. My audience 44 is what we're using um, yeah. at the moment, but I, I don't think you can see it in the camera and I'm afraid right. to pick it up because my microphone's plugged into it. <laughs> mm, fantastic. Yeah, the, the, the Sono's not plugged in because I was doing a, a stream uh, over the weekend where I was mixing on an iPad and I was using the Sono as the interface for the iPad. Nice. And then sending the output out to a couple of DI boxes to the, the stream. So yeah, it's absolutely wonderful for stuff like that. And it's usually my uh, at-home interface for the podcast and for mixing because the headphone outputs are really, really good and all, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but because I'm trapped at home, I took something with more channels home. What is one of the main benefits that initially drew you to Reaper beyond the other wonderful things we've been talking about? This is one of those things that this, this was nearly 10 years ago, but one of the things that initially drew me in once I was convinced by how powerful it was, honestly, was the price. And it's one of those things where it, it sounds silly, but um, back 10 years ago, you could get things like Pro Tools LE or M powered, uh, which were hundreds of pounds or dollars, but you had to use their set interfaces. Uh, there was, uh, Cubase was relatively, it was in the hundreds of dollars. Uh, but then also you had to pay for your interface. So then by that, that time, you've spent quite a lot of money. Uh, Reaper was $60, six zero. And it's one of those things that I, know people who cracked software and that kind of thing. Uh, but with Reaper, I never did. It gave you a 30 day trial, but then at the end of the 30 day trial, it did just keep working. But then by that point, I was so into using it that I just, of course, paid the $60. I mean, why wouldn't you? Uh, I think one of the big problems that potentially, from my perspective, uh, Reaper might have faced over the past several years is that it's got all these features that have built up, but the price hasn't gone up uh, accordingly. And so I think it's seen by a lot of people 
as cheap when in fact it's just inexpensive. And yep. you know, it's one of those things that I think the the luxury principle where something must be good because it's expensive doesn't always track. And this for me is one of those times where it's so much more powerful than its price tag suggests. Yeah, I, I tell this story quite often about working in a music store as a teenager and them having this beautiful handmade guitar on the wall. And it was, a I don't know, 800 pounds or something like that. And it was covered in dust. And so mm. one, because it had been up there for several years. So one day I took it down on my own volition and just cleaned it all up, polished it up. And this is pre kind of internet, internet, you know, it was in its infancy. So I called the manufacturer and told them the model. Mm. And they're like, oh, that, that guitar is now 1,200 pounds, so it had gone up half as much again. So I cleaned it up, made it pretty, put the brand new price on the wall, and I am not schnizzling you. It sold in two days. It had been up there for three years and didn't sell. Yeah. It became more expensive and got a bit, bit of a shine on it, and it sold in a couple of days. It's just, it, it is, it is interesting that we do perceive something as, you know, if, if a Rolls Royce is, uh, you know, 100, 500,000, it's got to be better than a Mercedes at 100 or whatever. But we know that not to be true. Um, there's just different perceptions. What I love about the Reaper community and the people I know that use it, like you and Glenn and so many others, is it fits into my kind of ethos of like us getting together as a community and helping each other. So anything that's proactive like that is huge for me because, look, we're in the middle of this little pandemic -y thing and this lockdown in case nobody had noticed. And, and it's like people are coming together and helping each other. And, you know, I think it's wonderful. So I love what you're doing. Speaking of which, you have a course. We have done a course together. Tell me all about the course. So the course uses the uh, the videos that I've done on YouTube before as a, as a basics tutorial, as a springboard, and goes absolutely all the way. So it goes from, here's how you turn it on, here's how you get a sound, right the way through to, here's how you do some clever stuff. Like, like we talked about changing themes, sidechain compression, all the really clever stuff like manipulating MIDI on the fly, all sorts of out there stuff, but done step by step by step. Uh, I think at last count, uh, there were 78 sections. It's something like nine and a half hours of video. And we keep Amazing. adding to it because it's one of those things where new features are coming out and we can make new sections to go, oh, by the way, this is a thing now. It's so comprehensive, uh, but it's broken down into manageable bite-sized chunks as well so that it's not just over-facing. You can get one little bit, two little bits. If there's one thing in particular that you need to reference and you're like, I've heard about this. What does it do? You can go and locate that section and it's just so comprehensive. It took a month to do all the writing and most of the primary filming and it drove me slightly insane, but hopefully it's been worth it for everybody because whoa, it's got a real piece of my soul in there. Oh, it's absolutely amazing. Well, very, very exciting. Of course, there will be links to go and check that out. Adam, this has been Rather wonderful. I'm, I, it's a, such a shame that even though we're both from the UK, you are about, we are <laughs> several thousand miles away from each other. So I'll give you a virtual handshake here. Yes. <laughs> so thank you ever so much. I really, really appreciate it. Everybody, please check out the link below to the, to the course. You can tell one of the things that I'm really, really impressed about Adam and about everything that's going on here. And what he's doing is it fits in incredibly into our philosophy about community. And I really, really appreciate um, having this insight from Adam as to really what is great about Reaper. I was blown away from that little 20 minute video I did with Glenn. I cannot exaggerate that it was exactly the length it took to film is what we put it up in there. And then the response was overwhelming. One of the biggest, if not the biggest philosophy of behind Produce Like a Pro is to get people started making music. It's to go against those old ideas that, you know, you have to have this, that, and the other. Trust me, I love vintage gear. I love great gear, but I don't want to stop people from making music because they believe they have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars. Like we were talking about earlier, I am running everything through an ID44 here. Most of the time my recording is done on inexpensive gear. That is, is not just a necessity. It is pretty much all I need now. I'm outside of tracking on like drums and full band. I just need a microphone and one mic pre and an interface. And so 
everything that Adam's doing here and we're talking about here really supports that philosophy. So thank you once again, my thank friend. Thank you, sir. And if you have Reaper questions, please leave them below. Leave some Reaper questions because I will get Adam to answer them. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Warren. Yeah, I, I certainly will. Would I'll be keeping an us? eye on uh, as the video on loads of questions uh, come in. I'll try my best to answer everything. It's going to be like playing whack-a-mole. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Have a marvellous time recording and mixing. I'll see you all again very, very soon. <laughs>